Marvin Goldfried is a distinguished professor of psychology at Stony Brook University, where he helped to develop the graduate program in clinical psychology. He's the co-founder of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. Alan Francis is a professor of psychiatry and chair emeritus at Duke and was chair of the DSM-IV task force. Marvin describes the evolution of his psychotherapy orientation as psychodynamic, behavioral, CBT, and eventually integrative. He practices, teaches, and supervises what works clinically using direct and indirect evidence base. Alan describes his approach to psychotherapy as whatever works or no one size fits all. He was trained and taught at the Columbia University Psychoanalytic Center, but remains equally interested in brief, supportive, cognitive, behavioral, interpersonal, and family therapies. Please enjoy this week's episode. Good morning and welcome to Talking Therapy. I am Marvin Goldfried and my colleague and esteemed and long-term friend is Alan Francis. Good morning, Alan. Hey, Mark. So the topic is something I think you will be inspired by, which is um, therapy as inspiration. And I know this is a, a theme that's run through so many of your comments. So can I pass the hot potato to you and let you start? Yeah, I, I think that we've recommended it before, but let's recommend it again, that Jerome Frank wrote one of the very best books in psychotherapy 50 years ago called Persuasion and Healing. And I read it as a resident, and I've reread it a number of times since, and it's inspiring to me. The basic thesis of Frank's work was that Therapy had been invented as probably the second profession going back several hundred thousand years ago that the shaman, essential person in every tribe, most important person in, in, in the tribe in most cases, and often a shay woman, there was often a woman, had the role of handling mental illness along with a lot of other responsibilities. So along with mediating with the spirit world, the shaman had to deal with behaviors that were causing problems within the small group, that any tribe would have a great deal of trouble with behavioral problems with people having physical or medical symptoms. And the, the shaman's job was to take care of this, to stabilize the, the tribe, to stabilize the world, to stabilize the the, um, the spirits that might be interfering with people's uh, everyday functioning. And that therapists today are very much like the shaman of, of days of old, that we may have a greater understanding of mental disorder, that we may have additional techniques to deal with it, but that we should never forget the basic shaman role, which was to bring the person into a magic circle to have a set of rituals that both par parties believed in, to negotiate a way out of the current troubles, and basically to inspire hope, to, to, feel, to give the person who was previously feeling uniquely damned all alone, to inspire hope that things could get, get better, yeah. to provide a means for that person to reverse demoralization and to recover to a normal state. And I think that this inspiring role of psychotherapy tends to get lost if we focus too exclusively on individual techniques. The more treatments are manualized, the less we focus on inspiration and meaning as an important part of therapy. You know, the, I, I look, b before our uh, podcast this morning, I looked up the dictionary definition of inspire. Um, and uh, very simple, but kind of like very enlightening for me. It said to create a state of motion to bring about a change in thinking, emotion, and behavior. And it's like, well, that's what therapy is about, isn't it? Change in thinking, emotion, and behavior. And I, I think it, the term also goes back to inspire, to take in air. The idea was that the spirits would be brought in from outside. Yeah. And that there's something spiritual. I'm, I'm the least religious person in the entire world. 
but that doesn't mean that I don't respect spiritual feelings. The the idea that we're there's something more important than our daily round of activity, that there's a certain beauty in the world and that we can each of us find meaning in that world. And that in addition to helping people get over symptoms, I think we have to inspire them to feel that their lives are meaningful and that they have a role that counts and that they can feel uh, important enough so that it's worthwhile going through the everyday round of, of activities. Do you think that the research findings that people who are religious seem to have less of a, um, a prevalence of uh, um, psychological problems, do you think that that somehow is connected to what we're talking about? I think it's very hard. We, we, when I was at Duke, we had people doing a lot of research on this. The thing that's hard to tease apart is the community that comes with being religious. So it's hard to know how much it's the individual religious experience ah, versus the fact that you have a built-in support system when things go bad. And, and not just the physical material support system, not just an interpersonal support system, but also an intellectual support system. Mm-hmm. No, an interesting point. Interesting point. So it's it's you know for implications for therapy, it's uh, individual versus group therapy for a given problem. And I, I don't recall seeing any research done on that in in recent years, where the group certainly influences the individual. We know that for for sure. Uh, we know that from research. We know that from what's going on now and. Uh, social media, um, that people are influenced by other people. But that would be an interesting study to take something and, and a, a nice uh, topic could be social anxiety done either individually or in a group. Um, and a lot of the CBT interventions um, using technique are done in a group, so there's that confound. But anyway... Um, Let me just go to that in a minute. I think one of the unfortunate aspects of DSM related also to how insurance companies reimburse uh -huh. is that group and family therapies, which had been very popular in the 60s and 70s, tended to be wiped out as DSM focused just on individual diagnosis and insurance companies stopped paying for family and group therapy. But the, the a lot of the problems people have in terms of lost meaning occur because they feel cut off from a larger community. Mm -hmm. but very often working with the family is much more productive than working with the individual because it's so helpful in finding meaning in the family relationships that may never become accessible if the therapy is individual. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what com comes to mind immediately for me is uh, the separate research uh, that's done on family over-involvement and criticism. Uh, and, the, and the findings that individual therapy for the identified patient is not as effective if they have a family or some kind of social environment uh, that criticizes them and that over controls them. So it's, it's kind of like criticism and over control may be the polar opposite of inspiration functionally in that it, they decrease the chances of change. So it's an interesting and one of the ways that people get inspired is by an awareness that they're not alone, that they're part of a community, that they can yeah. contribute to others. Helping others is very often a very useful way of feeling better about oneself. Absolutely, yeah. And, I, and I'm thinking, you know, stepping totally outside of the therapy box, individual or family or, or, or group, um, I was very inspired by Kennedy. I don't know if I, I don't think I ever told you this. I got my degree in mid-year in January, when he was being inaugurated as president back in the 60s. And he made a comment. Um, yeah, he, the torch is being passed on and things like that. Um, but he said that any person can make a difference and every person should try. And that has stuck with me all these years. Professionally, I want to make a difference. I, I keep hearing that again and again. So there's inspiration outside of therapy. In the 220 years ago, Edmund Burke, English 
philosopher expressed the same thought, but somewhat differently, that no one ever made a greater mistake doing nothing because they could only do little. And one of the things that therapy, I think, helps people become aware of is ways they make a difference. Uh, very often people come to therapy very demoralized, feeling that they're just a burden in the world. Feeling oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now we're talking about patients and, no, and therapists also making a difference, certainly. I mean, the whole notion of burnout in health professionals uh, often occurs when there's a responsibility to, some, uh, to somebody, but the inability to make a change. That's interesting. Yeah. That's really interesting that th therapists, why do therapists burn out? It's because they stop feeling inspired themselves, I guess. And they, they don't realize that there's always an opportunity to help the patient change. And, and in fact, doing that helps them change. Yeah. Well, <laughs> here's the reciprocity. If therapy works, and it works at least partially, and maybe not totally, but partially, because the therapist is able to inspire the patient, and then the patient changes the thoughts, feelings, and actions, then the therapist is making a difference and becomes inspired to do more. So I was lucky. I had a lot of in inspiring supervisors, but I was even luckier in that I had lots of inspiring patients. Yeah, yeah. So inspiration certainly is not the sole uh, property of, uh, of therapy. Um, good mentors inspire. Uh, which means they encourage their mentee to do something, which also means that they have to kind of let go of control of, of the uh, mentorship relationship and let the mentee go off on her or his own. So I think, you know, that it, inspiration has to give the person who's being inspired, whether it's a mentee or a patient, the opportunity to, to spread their own wings. And, and too many supervisors focus on criticism mm. and find out what was done wrong and correcting rather than seeing the poetry of the relationship, or, but relationships, both the relationship between the supervisor and, and the trainee and the relationship between the trainee and, and the patient that somehow the supervisor shouldn't be pick, picking little nitpicking little flaws in the technique. They should be putting the technique in the context of the overall relationships. Alan, did I tell you that I, that I was asked to write a memoir for a journal, professional journal? Oh yeah. Yeah. We mentioned I, this. I mentioned that. Yeah. I didn't mention that. And as I'm looking, as I'm writing and thinking back, I was really naive and terrible when I started on I'm not saying I'm, you know, fantastic now, but I'm much better now than I was. But to criticize early on somebody who is naive and terrible certainly is not inspiration by any means. And people change. Uh, so I do think, you know, if we talk about the mentorship relationship, it's accepting the person for where they are and encouraging them to grow. There's a chicken and egg here. Do you think that you were really that bad at the beginning? Yes. Or your supervisors made you feel that bad, and that's why you look back up upon it in the Both. way you do. Both. I mean, I, I had one supervisor. It was, like, really bad. Because, you know, we're talking about the 50s. One supervisor um, who commented on a patient that I was seeing who had lower back pain. And he said, I think there may be some latent homosexuality operating here. So, you know, it was bad. And I did a lots of other things, which I won't go into, which was stupid. But let's let's get back to the to the issue of uh, of inspiration. Well, I have a question for you, Marvin. How will you make your memoir inspirational? That's an interesting question. I think and, and, and I, I haven't been thinking about that precisely. But I talk about all the mistakes I've made. And, okay, I'm not bragging, but I've won a lot of awards. 
in professional organizations. But prior to that, I was a screw up in many ways. So if somebody is reading it and they're feeling that, you know, I'm not very much, it does, hopefully they're not going to use that as a prediction that they can't be very much. But my, my, I haven't, I've gotten halfway through it. I haven't written the end. I'm not quite sure what to put at the end. Um, but let's get back to therapy. We'll deal with this another time. Okay, so inspiration is good. And even in the early days of, of behavior therapy, inspiration played an important role. I don't know if you know this. Len Krasner, who was one of the driving forces in the development of behavior therapy in the United States, was very Skinnerian in his background. And he wrote an American psychologist article where I think the title was something to the effect of the therapist as a social reinforcement machine. And that the best therapist doesn't appear like a machine, but rather uses an interpersonal influence to encourage the patient to change. And he doesn't, I don't think he uses the word inspire. Um, but basically, it's using the relationship. Uh, and this was, this was before very much emphasis was placed on technique. So that the very early roots of, of behavior therapy did talk about the relationship. That would have been in the 60s, 70s? In the 60s. You know, it's interesting because that, that was the peak of existential thinking within psychoanalysis with, again, the focus of finding meaning, not just curing symptoms or uh, solving conflicts, but also that therapy had to have as its purpose helping the person find meaning in their lives. And the other thing that occurs to me as an association we've discussed is the way the Becks have become more involved with including hope, meaning, recovery techniques in, as part of their cognitive therapy approach not just focusing on symptoms, but focusing on the person's life goals and what they think is important in life and what gives their life uh, a sense of being worth living. You know, as you're saying this, I'm translating the words into to jargon within okay. CBT. Do it. Uh, and there's the notion of motivational interviewing. Yeah. Affectionately known as MI. And what is motivational interviewing? It's helping the patient, well, obviously become motivated, but there's an element of inspiration, even though CBT folks don't use mushy terms like, like inspiration. But if we look at the function, the function is to help the patient change and grow in their thinking, in their feeling, in their behavior. And it's particularly geared toward people who don't want to make changes and don't want to grow. So we started, it started off with um, um, alcohol and, and other addictive uh, abuse where people were um, referred for therapy even though they didn't want to change. So, they, so the, the, the motivational interviewing is letting the person realize on their own that it would be to their advantage to change. So that may be part of inspiration. And I, I think a related issue is demoralization. Again, something emphasized in Frank's book and de-emphasized in everything to do with mental health. That because there's no DSM diagnosis for demoralization, because there aren't specific techniques and manuals developed to handle, to deal with demoralization, it tends to be the elephant in the room that no one ever talks about. At least in my experience, the symptoms patients present with are only a tiny fraction of their problem, that the reaction to those symptoms, the demoralization caused by having those symptoms, whether they be medical symptoms or psychiatric symptoms, this is often the, the real, really most important target to, to address because unless you have hope, that things can get better in your life and hope that therapy can make them better, whatever else the therapist does is likely to be useless. 
Well, I, I kind of think of hope and inspiration less as an outcome and more as a process of change. So really? somebody can come in because they're unhappy and, and you don't have to have a DSM uh, in the picture to do this. Somebody can be unhappy in their relationships or in their, um, uh, in their work situation or their schooling or some other aspect, which is not necessarily a DSM diagnosis. Um, and they don't come into therapy for hope. Hope is, I think, is the process that causes yes. them to change. I see it somewhat differently that I think when people develop initial symptoms, often medical symptoms, and our business usually psych psychological symptoms, the symptom itself creates problems in, in a person's life. Panic attacks create problems. Yeah. Depression creates problems. Compulsions create problems. The reaction to those problems is often much worse than the original problem. Yes. People start getting down on themselves. They start feeling uniquely damned. They become hopeless about there being change. And the hopelessness often is a more important target, especially at the beginning in what some people call motivational interviewing. What I call is remoralization. Yeah. The feeling that when you're coming to therapy, this is different, that you can get something out of this that you haven't gotten out of the previous efforts on your own or in previous therapies, the sense that we can do something here that will really matter, that I understand your problem. I've seen it often. I've seen many people with this kind of problem find real happiness in life yeah. that we don't have to feel, that you don't have to feel that you're in a spiral, a downward spiral, a vicious cycle. And then if we can find even small areas of improvement, of pleasure, of good minutes in your day, that these will spiral, help you spiral up to create a virtual, well, I, I, I a virtuous disagree, cycle. I don't disagree. I, I disagree with you in one aspect of what you're saying. I, I totally agree that this occurs in therapy. And I think, and maybe we're just quibbling semantically, I think of that more as process or principle of change rather than a goal of change. So it's, it's a process change along the way where the person has expectation and motivation. And it's often to do the work of therapy, to change their behavior, their thinking, their feeling. So I see it as a condition of change that brings about change in other aspects of the person's functioning. And in the process, obviously, uh, if the process is uh, uh, effective or the principle of change is met, um, then there's change in that, in the manifestation of that principle. I don't know. I, mean, I, think, we do see it, I think we do see it differently. And the way that this would express itself as the time relationship. So if you see this process, it's something that develops out of the success of the therapy, where I, I see it very much an important part of the first interview, first couple of interviews, that people who come in often don't expect much out of therapy, have been demoralized by previous life and therapy failures, and that somehow or other, there has to be something magical that happens in the early relationship that helps to, in a small way, begin to reverse that. And I'm, I think that would be back to our title. That's kind of inspiring the patient. Yes, yes. But, but they didn't. Yes, I agree with that. But I guess I'm labeling that as part of the process of change in their lives. It helps to bring about the change um, so that their interpersonal functioning is better, so that they're their uh, competence in their work or academic functioning is better so that um, their symptomatology is decreased. I see those as the ultimate goal and outcome and that the inspiration is a necessary condition. But, okay, you know, before we get through... Let me just say one thing. To me, ahead. first session is the most important session. I think we agree on this. Yes. Yeah. And for me, the reason, well, we both 
I've said this many times that the reason the first session is the most important is because if it doesn't go well, you don't have a second session. Exactly. But I think that the mechanism of that is that somehow the patient has to feel in that first meeting yes. that this can help. Yeah. I, I went to a, feel, however yeah. bad things seem, this can help. I, I once went to a conference where they, they played a video or one of them was CBT and the other was, I think, either experiential or psychodynamic. But it was just early on in the session, so uh, I don't remember what the ultimate course of therapy was. But these are two in individuals, and they showed the video, and the way they were exactly the same was how they spoke to the patient. There was a sense of concern, of confidence. It's like, okay, listen, we're going to work together, and we're going to be able to handle this problem. It was like the tone of voice, the facial expression, and all of that. And I think this is what makes it hard for beginning therapists uh, to be as inspirational uh, as more experienced as experienced therapists. But there's, there's one thing before we finish that that I that I think is um, a bit of a downside in what we're talking about. Uh, there are some people who believe that, and sometimes I think you're one of those people <laughs> that this is all there is to therapy. And I think somebody like Bruce Wampold and Common Factors says this is this is what it is. It's all inspiration. And I think that reflects a concept, a, a prototype of therapy that is very, very limited and is 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 old. I think it's it's also impersonal. It's as if, oh, I'm gonna go in and inspire people. Yes, and that's gonna that's kind gonna of like a revival, a revival meeting rather than being geared very closely to that individual's own life, their own perspective, their own symptoms, their own relationships, their own stressors, you have to find inspiration in the specific, not just have a general kind of feel good attitude towards exactly, it. Exactly. So if somebody is anxious and depressed because they're not functioning well, and they're not functioning well because they have ADD, and they're disorganized, and you help them to become more more organized, and they feel better. There are some people who will say that's not therapy. Yeah. They will say it's therapeutic, but it's not therapy. And I think there's nothing worse than fake inspiration, fake reassurance. You know, everything's going to be fine. You yeah. can't make promises. Right. that you can't deliver on. You can't say everything's going to be okay if it's not going to be okay. You can't sort of generalize inspiration and have the same inspiration for every person. It has to be something very specific and realizable for that individual. Rather than follow the theory. Yep. A, a, a colleague and very wise man and friend of mine would always say, follow the patient. There you go. <laughs> okay, Marvin, I'm sure that your memoirs will inspire tens of thousands of therapists. Oh, well, I hope so. Um, I it hope must, it must be inspiring for you to, to write it. It helps to put your own life in perspective. It's interesting. I, um, when, I'm thinking about all the money that I've saved on psychoanalysis by writing my own memoir. But it's interesting because I have... Um, come to realize as a function of writing this memoir of the influences in my life that I had never seen before, um, of how my parents in, in ways uh, and their behavior served as role models, implicit role models, or sometimes I think of it as the silent learning that have, uh, has gotten me to become a more effective in my personal and professional functioning. Where, where will it appear? in uh, the uh, annual review of clinical psychology, probably next summer. I think we'll all look it's forward to it. Yet, so. I think it'd be very useful on our chats for you to bring up insights that you've had in going through your own life. I think it'd be very helpful to other people. Oh, really? That's interesting. I, I may do that. I'm, maybe I ought to finish the first draft first. I'm about halfway through, but good point. Stay safe. Okay. Bye-bye.